My name is Hannah, and this is the House Party Podcast from Ivory Innovations. We bring you the top entrepreneurs, researchers, and practitioners in the industry to shine a light on housing affordability solutions. Today, we're going to chat with Jennifer Gilbert, the executive director and founder of Housing Navigator Massachusetts, a tech flat platform that brings transparency to affordable housing. We'll hear about some of the unique challenges in founding a tech for good venture in the housing space. Looking for affordable housing is a complex process in the US. While you can check low income or income restricted filters on tools like Zillow and Trulia, very few buildings actually show up when you do so. For example, in 2020 in Cambridge, Massachusetts, if a family wanted to find affordable housing, they would have to go to 24 different offices. And that's just for a city of 115,000 people. This is what Housing Navigator wanted to change and has changed for low income families in Massachusetts. Housing Navigator launched in 2021 with 160,000 rentals in 275 plus cities. Through the platform, you can access every type of income restricted housing in Massachusetts and filter by a variety of criteria. Most notably, the availability, so whether it's lottery, waitlist open or waitlist closed, and the accessibility of those units. Just last week, they added a new feature to show units with less than a six month wait. They are the first to do this. Housing Navigator was also one of our top 10 finalists for the Ivory Prize this last year. We believe the platform brings something really unique and innovative to this space, a one-stop shop for navigating the affordable housing market. We are so lucky to have Jennifer with us today. Jennifer, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for having me, Hannah. So this story we know starts back in 2018, and one of the first things you did was start a steering committee. Now, when I hear steering committee, I hear process and a lot of opinions, things that could really slow you down, especially right at the beginning. Um, I'm guessing other tech platforms didn't start with a steering committee. So I'm curious, why was the steering committee such an important first step for you? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think it really goes to how do you get to the results that you just mentioned, which is being a one-stop shop. Um, For us, it meant starting with a process that involved kind of every every person with an interest or imaginable. And that's really what the steering committee was about. I too, I'm not a fan of steering committees. I don't raise my hand for a lot of process. I like to get a lot of things done, to be honest. And sometimes it's true, you can get very slowed down. This was very much though about the idea that you know, alone, you go faster, together, you go farther. And convening all the types of people, groups um, that had an interest in creating this platform at the outset was really important to the strength of the launch and the strength of the venture long term. And so that meant that the steering committee had owners of affordable housing on it, it had regulators, it had representatives of organizations that uh, serve people experiencing homelessness. It had people with lived experience of housing instability, all of those things that you want to speak to the important goals for an effort like this. So I would also say for people who hear steering committee and sort of start to break out in the rash, um, you have to think about how you're gonna use that input well. And the the point all along was to really convene people, but to convene towards an end product. And so there were lots of methods used along the way to to get that feedback and get that robust engagement and buy-in, and also make sure that everybody knew we are going to build something. And this is where, you know, the tech idea of you build something and then you adapt it also becomes part of the conversation. So we were gonna build something and maybe it wouldn't have every problem or issue solved, but it would make progress towards having more problems and more issues solved. Mm -hmm. So for us, again, really important first step and uh, one that I think um, if it slowed us down um, at all, and I I don't really think it did, um, but if it did, it was all for much 
stronger long-term results. And I believe also the longer sustainability of the effort. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious to understand like the, the role that the steering committee played in some of the big decisions that you made early on. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm wondering if you feel like, um, like without the, the input and guidance of the steering committee, there were points early on where you, you might have taken housing navigator in a different, different direction. Yeah, there were, there were several. Um, one big one was early on, I think when you're just trying to envision what is this thing that we're going to create, because for a long time, there had been talk in the sort of policy community in Massachusetts about we need a one stop shop, we need a portal. But what does that mean? You know, that can Mm -hmm. mean a bunch of different things. And for a lot of people, particularly, I would say, um, some of the folks that were more on the policy side, um, they did think, oh, well, you can just build a database and people will go in and find some information. It'll be helpful. And the steering committee was really helpful in saying, we really need to build this with a mind towards how our renter users going to use it, not researchers who want to find out how many units of affordable housing we have in Massachusetts. That is actually something that we also end up producing. Um, But really, how do we build in the user experience and the clarity for users that lets renters, service providers, really anyone use it to do housing search. So that was really important part of the steering committee. There were a lot of other things, small and large decisions that um, I don't know where we might have ended up without it. And Mm -hmm. it really was fundamental to thinking through what is the first iteration of this product look like. Along the way, somebody gave me a really good idea. I didn't come up with this idea, so I can call it very wise. Um, But (laughs) we did a product description that was a total layperson's description of what we wanted the product to be. Mm. It had almost no tech terms in it at all. I don't know if it had any. I should go back and look at it. Um, And that was really important to get everybody on the same page and say, this is what we want the tool to do, how we're going to judge the first the first release is a success. We actually, when we went out to look for software developers, we used that in the RFP saying, this is what we're gonna wanna build towards. And it had none of the technical specs mm-hmm. in it. Um, but the steering committee you know, all came together and blessed that. And so we really did have everyone sort of, ex- we had everyone unified around a set of expectations for the platform that were extremely unified and and helpful. Mm -hmm. Um, One interesting thing is there was one member of the steering committee who we thought of as our technology person. And uh, he always, he would always say, Oh, I'm not really a technology person. I think that's just because he wasn't a software engineer. He's definitely a technology (laughs) person. And he suggested early on, Oh, well, you should have user personas as part of the product description. And it's so funny to me looking back that no one else on the steering committee even thought about that. Mm. But they actually were thinking about that exact concept. They wouldn't have called it user personas, right. but they would have called it, you know, building for the audience, building for, you know, interested parties, building for equity. The words that are more used by people in the nonprofit space or service provider space versus the war, the words that are used in the technology space. Mm-hmm. And it's always been fun to see how those two fields are actually aiming often towards the same things while using different language that they don't necessarily, they might not necessarily recognize they're saying the same things. <laughs> yeah. And I would imagine that's probably also why it was, so helpful to have that product description in like mm-hmm. really straightforward, plain, non-tech, techie language, um, yeah. just because you did have such a diverse group of, of folks as part of the steering committee. So to make sure everyone was aligned on just, you know, very straightforward, this is what we're building, this is who it's for and not, you know, integrating too much jargon. Yeah, yeah, and very, very clear. This is who it's for, this is what it got to do to just be the basic first release. And here are some things also that got parked that were sort of might be good to include this, but we may have to wait for later Mm. to figure out how to do it. Yeah. So I kind of want to follow up on on that piece quickly. Like, how did you decide 
what would be part of that of your primary, you know, initial high priority focus items for, you know, version one of the platform versus what did you kind of table for later? And how did yeah, you decide and, what, to, the what to table for later? Yeah, in the steering committee process or later on? Because there were definitely some things that, you know, got tabled early. And then there were some things that we realized we were going to have to do some more work to actually accomplish mm -hmm. along the way. Which which ones? Yeah, maybe is the ones that were kind of part of this, the, the, the steering committee was a part of. Yeah, so some of it was about once we brought on software engineers to do more of a feasibility study mm. with some of their advice on some of the things that were <clears throat> just going to be mechanically harder yeah. to pull off and were going to be expensive or there wasn't an obvious solution. So that that's helpful. I mean, people did understand we had the realities of needing to raise money to do this. I mean, we started the process without any money at all and pretty quickly had a couple of foundations come in saying that they would support it. So people did understand that. And I think the other thing that was helpful was having a steering committee, I think reinforced everyone feeling like, okay, these may get parked, but there are a whole lot of people who are going to come back and keep asking for them. Mm -hmm. A big one at early on was actually how many uh, languages, um, because mm -hmm. a tool, I, when we started in 2018, the, sort of widespread use of tools like Google Translate, it just wasn't there yet. And so people's experience with um, that was, was not good. And at the beginning, while we knew it was really important to have a tool that could be accessed in different languages, nobody knew how to solve that without literally every page having independent translation, something that seemed impossible for a site mm -hmm. where every page is dynamic and yeah every building listing is multiple pages. So that was one of the ones where we said, we are going to have to wait and see how we solve this mm -hmm. very real concern, very important to figure out how to do it. Um, and then along the way, you know, technology got better at doing translation. So that was really a good thing to see. Had we gone to what would have been the alternative in 2018 and, translated each page, page by page, uh, we got an early estimate that that was millions of dollars. Um, wow. Yeah, well, thank goodness for the advancement <laughs> <in> that. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it's still not, it's, you know, far from perfect. Um, it was interesting as well that after we kept talking about language, what everyone really realized is that a big part of the problem was clarifying all the affordable housing jargon mm -hmm. in a user-centered way yeah. um, just starting with the English version of it totally you know, what you might translate into and so that was also where a steering committee was really helpful are we talking about language access meaning needs to be translated in different languages are we talking about how can this tool use words that any anybody using it will understand so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to search for the most deeply affordable housing. <laughs> I want to search for units that have mobility features. You know, how do we translate that um, into more everyday terms? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Another decision that I'm I'm curious to learn about, and I'm not sure if how much the steering committee waited on this, if at all. But you're structured as a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. um, I imagine early on there were some conversations about, you know, for-profit, non-profit, like where does this live? Um, and there are definitely other tech for good ventures that have adopted a for-profit model. So um, I'm curious how you how you landed on that. Yeah, it's funny. It was not a steering committee conversation. And the funny part is, while I absolutely think someone could think about what we do as a for-profit venture or within government, it was, I actually do not remember a single conversation about doing housing navigator as a for-profit. Mm. And I think that was because of the kind of Massachusetts housing ecosystem that came out of it, uh, out of that the effort came out of was kind of more used to doing something like this as a nonprofit is building a coalition that includes a lot of nonprofit. And very quickly we were talking about raising philanthropic funds um, and the earliest seed funders were foundations that typically prefer philanthropy over 
um, you know, more in a uh, social justice kind of investment. Mm -hmm. So in part, it was about where we thought we could find the foundational money, but it wasn't really discussed at the steering committee level. All right. So I want to, um, we've talked a lot about the steering committee and some of, some of the decisions that you made early on with, with their help. I want to shift to talk about one of the values that you established early on as an organization uh, and the value is called focused. And you share that this value um, or how you describe this value, we serve and value everyone who uses what we create, believing in their resourcefulness. We strive to make everything we produce as functional, understandable, reliable, and beautiful as the equivalent product created by the for-profit market. So I wanna just learn a bit more about this and kind of where this came from and, and how this informed, how you thought about the, the tools, user experience. Yeah, so um, I really love uh, the set of phrases that you just went through because it's very much guided my thinking and I think the product team's thinking every time we had a difficult decision or uh, whenever we we're kind of trying to prioritize things. And those words have ended up meaning a lot. They were very thoughtfully worked through by the board and the steering committee morphed into our board. Most of our board members served on the steering committee. Um, the word I love the most is beautiful because I think it's a word that describes something people do not expect from a technology platform that's primarily intended for low income people. Um, and I love that we not only made that a goal, but we achieved it. And I know we achieved it because people have told us that they think the site is beautiful. I have told this story often about a meeting we had with advocates for people with disabilities early on. And we knew that there were some things about the site that weren't as good as we wanted them to be around serving people with mobility needs. Um, so I didn't know what to expect from the meeting, but the very first thing that someone said was when they unmiked, you know, your site is beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I loved that. I loved that that was their very first comment. So mm -hmm. achieving that ends up serving so many purposes. I think it dignifies the process for people, it respects them, and it gives our users an incredible amount of, I think, kind of ownership, allegiance, you know, trust in the product that's mm -hmm. real, that, that's authentic. Another thing I'm very proud of is that we have these um, organizational, you know, news on what's up at Housing Navigator. Uh, we have subscribers that are a subset of our subscribers that also subscribe to our every uh, every other week we do a listing of you know kind of active properties. And the open rate on our organizational e-news is very high. And our users, our renter users read about the organization. And I think that's in part because they're having this experience of a platform that's beautiful and created for them. And it's a product mm -hmm. that they, you know, trust and value. So really important word, they're beautiful. Um, also um, valuing the resourcefulness of our users. The whole idea of the product is that it gives people agency. And, you know, my own career history is I started uh, working after college at a shelter for people experiencing homelessness. And then I worked in legal services with people who were losing their homes from eviction or foreclosure. And I found that the people I worked with were amazingly resourceful and amazingly energetic and problem solvers on a level that I'll never be. What they often didn't have was information. Mm -hmm. And the tool is very much about providing people information so they can make the best choices for them so that they can to affect comparison shop, all those things that I get to do as somebody mm -hmm. with a lot more privilege and who, you know, the tech world is very interested in providing products for me. So those words, again, I, I think that about that phrase all the time, you know, reliable, all those pieces are very much what underpins having a product that is useful and with any luck, you know, beloved and well used over time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think it, it's also, I was also struck by the word beautiful as part of that description. Yeah. I think so many other aspects of applying for affordable housing and finding affordable housing are very much 
not beautiful um, and, and are quite complicated and um, very much not user centric. And so yeah. I would imagine it's, it's refreshing and yeah, it's, it's wonderful to have this be the platform that they're using to find housing. Well, it's funny. One of the board members who uh, you know refers to herself all the time as a bureaucrat, and she's an amazing bureaucrat. Like she really gets a lot done. When we had that discussion, uh, she objected to the word "beautiful." She mm-hmm. said, "I think it should be taken out mm-hmm. because I don't know what it means, and why do we need to make this beautiful? We just need to make it work." Mm-hmm. And I, I think at the time, I was a little bit worried that I had been kind of too sharp in my rebuttal because I was <laughs> only recently had become the ED of this fledgling thing. And I was like, Oh, what if I made her mad at me? And I said, no, 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 it has to be beautiful. And I think I might have literally said like, if it's not beautiful, I'm not doing it. Um, like I was so adamant about it. And she always jokes now about how <laughs> she was wrong. <laughs> Just last week, she told me, I'm so glad you made it beautiful. I would have settled for just it works. Yeah. But it's so important that it's beautiful. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to ask about uh, one of the the bumps, perhaps the biggest bump uh, in this journey in in building the, the back end database. And that was when you realized that information on 80A units was simply not collected. Um, so if you wanted to share with users that a building had mobility units that matched their needs, you would have to get that information through each owner. Um, I imagine this was a huge surprise and required you to, to pivot in a lot of ways. So what did you do? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, back to the original steering committee and the discussion, everyone knew clearly a priority was trying to identify where opportunities were, where the in effect, the affordable housing system was creating units with all kinds of mobility adaptations, um, but they weren't visible. So Mm -hmm. those who needed them couldn't find them. And I thought, and I think most of us thought that that was collected, that the organizations that fund the buildings, you know, primarily our state office of housing, um, collected the information and we just needed to get it from them. And we had very early on data sharing agreements where they did offer us, you know, a lot of information um, to help us build the initial database. And then in a very early uh, Zoom with them, which I remember vividly, they said, oh no, we can't give you the information about where the ADA units are because our database doesn't have a field for it. So, you know, every building is required to have them. So they knew they were there, but they couldn't tell us, is it a two bedroom? Is it a three bedroom? They didn't know. Um, And we were shocked. So it was so important. We knew we had to come up with a very, very energetic plan B. Um, And the main thing was we're going to have to go to owners and we're going to have to ask them literally like, okay, you own this building. We know that there are accessible apartments in it. Are there two bedrooms? Are there three bedrooms? Tell us more. And so that meant that we both had to build out our input tool Mm -hmm. to make that an important category. We've done a bunch of other things as well. I mean, we do spend time, I think, really talking to owners about why it's important. And I really give a lot of credit to the team because it does take effort the person entering the information doesn't always know they may have to call a site. Um, And we also try to do whatever we can so that when we get new buildings listed, we collect that information from the beginning. It's actually now part of the financing closing process that buildings have to um, kind of declare what they're going to designate for ADA units. So now going forward, it should be much simpler. Wow. But it was a bunch of interventions, both, I would say, you know, our technology, the tool, educating and spreading the word and, you know, really engaging owners who, who mostly want to do it. They, mm-hmm. they want those to be transparent. They're not trying to hide it. It's just they built the building 15 years ago. They may have to do some work to find out exactly what the array is. Um, and then also that piece of some system change of let's change the system. So we're at least going forward, collecting it. Yeah. So now moving forward for every new project in the state of Massachusetts, that's 
and put it into the platform. Not only that, it's actually in the recorded use restriction. So wow. if Housing Navigator went away, somebody will be able to find it. That's great. By doing a public record search. <laughs> yeah, very cool. I, I want to, so for maybe folks that are listening to this that are inspired by what you've done in Massachusetts and are wanting to do something similar in their, their region or state, um, I, I feel like there might be some questions coming up or some voices in their head that are sort of like, well, how, how really would this work? Or why didn't you do it this way? Um, so I have two questions, kind of voices in your head questions. Um, so first question, isn't this building data just public information? Yes, it is. Um, <laughs> the thing that I learned though, and um, even when we had highly cooperative partners, which you know, we got to actually fairly quickly. The way that data is collected or what data is collected may not be the data that you need. So a big learning is that, you know, people collect data for the purposes that they need the data for. Yeah. And by and large, the people who had the full data on the buildings were those who had financed it or those who permitted it. Well, they don't need to know the same things that a renter needs to know about a building. So Great example, photographs. They don't necessarily have photographs of a building they gave tax credits to in 1996, but somebody who is thinking about living there would love to see a photograph. They also might not have detailed information on some of the things we've talked about, like mm -hmm. accessible units, like the exact income restrictions. They, they collect what they need. So while it is public information, it's all about a public resource, um, it doesn't mean... I always give this analogy. You can't just like pull up to the, the data store and plug in your, you know, your hose and have data come flowing out that fits exactly what you need to have yeah. a tool like this. That said, I think in other states, it may be far simpler. Um, it may be arranged better. Massachusetts is very creative about doing affordable housing at the local level, at the state level. That means that not everybody is dealing with the same buildings all the time and you have to go to some places one by one, sometimes at the city level. Um, so that could be unique to us or to only a few states, other places it could be far simpler to get that than it was for us. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I also want to say, because I think sometimes they're very, people are very daunted by the data task and I do believe it was something identified from the beginning, you know, our data needs to be really good. That's that's where reliable comes from. And even if it's people think that beautiful is that the user interface works well, beautiful is really that the data is very good mm -hmm. and up to date. So it's, it is super, super, super important. And a lot of things that are very important, especially things that are important to equity and social justice aren't easy. Mm -hmm. So it definitely takes um, some effort, especially at the beginning. Now that we've built it, you know, the level of effort is reduced to maintain yeah. it. Um, but it was, it was quite a bit of um, time. And I completely, completely misjudged the amount of resources and money it would take mm -hmm. by, by actually by a factor of 10, but um, we got there. <laughs> <laughs> my, my second question, you kind of got out a little bit with the like hose and, you know, data store analogy, but why didn't you just use an API? Hmm. It was that reason. The data wasn't collected um, in the form that we needed and about the things that we needed information on. We're always exploring that, though. So just so people know, I, yeah. while I didn't know at the beginning of this journey what in the world an API was, now I understand. <laughs> um, we've explored it a bunch of different ways, I, I think, we'll, and we'll always keep exploring it because ideally there would be more um, automation Um so we're very open to finding that that works mm -hmm. well for us. We have not found at this point that there is too much that's kind of already collected that can easily flow into our tool, but mm -hmm. we're going to keep trying on it. And every time somebody suggests something, while I'm more realistic at the beginning, I will just, I would just like talk to anyone and jump at any interview with anyone who maybe could give us data automatically. Now I know a little bit more, um, <laughs> But we all are always open to trying to figure out if that's possible because we know it would simpler will give you higher quality information. Yeah. Right. 
So I want to talk a shift to talk about the the future of housing navigators. So I know there's you know we've talked about the interest in replicating you know a housing navigator elsewhere in the U.S. There are a couple other states that have similar platforms. Um, and there's also some discussion around expanding the functionality of Housing Navigator within Massachusetts to mm -hmm. continue to support the affordable housing application process. So from your perspective, what's what's the vision? Where Where's Housing Navigator going next? Yeah, so I think our biggest goal is that we serve as an example to others about what we're trying to accomplish. So my vision is that there should be some source that is a one-stop shop mm -hmm. for renters looking for affordable housing in every state. And it should take them from the place of being able to do the initial search to being able to apply. And if that vision sounds grand, well, actually, that's exactly what I get. As a person with far more resources and far more privilege, I can do that. Yeah. I can do that. That's collected for me. That's available for me. And I know speaking, you know, for our team and also for our board, that's really what we would love to see. It doesn't have to be exactly like us because, you know, part of innovation is knowing that different places may do it in different ways, but that goal and you really have to question why isn't this available? Mm -hmm. Why doesn't this exist? Surely what, we did took some effort, but again, a lot of things take effort. And the value of this one place everyone can know can go to find reliable, high, high quality information is what I expect. You know, I just think that's there for me and it is there for me, mm -hmm. but it absolutely, I think as part of having a healthy, affordable housing ecosystem nationally needs to be there for everyone. And, you know, we say this all the time, but it's so obvious. People cannot choose to live in a place they can't find. Mm. And it is that bad. Um, in addition, the amount of time people waste, the burden on them looking is incredible. We get this comment all the time um, from people. I mean, people will call Housing Navigator things like life-changing, um, that it's just hours and hours of their time that they no longer have to spend desperately trying to figure out what are all the options for me in, yeah. you know, name your town, Lowell, Massachusetts. Instead, they can go on the site and see them all there and pick out ones they want to explore further and do that. And that's the kind of, you know, agency that we want to make happen. And that I think the vision is that that is possible for everyone everywhere. Mm hmm Absolutely. Yeah, it's hard to imagine going through an apartment search and not having a tool like Zillow to help you right. do so. Right. Early on, that was one of the things that I did. I When I gave a presentation on Housing Navigator, I'd ask, okay, raise your hand if you've moved in the last two years. And then I'd ask, you know, what did you, what tools did you use to start looking for a home? You know, whether you're trying to rent or buy. And of course, everybody said the first thing they did was pick up their phone mm -hmm. and start yeah. searching, you know, all the sites that we all know, ZillowApartments.com. And then, you know, ask like, if you were a person, a low income person, a person more moderate means, what would you do? And people did, almost didn't realize that the same thing didn't already exist. Mm -hmm. But at that time in particular, I would go do the searches in my own neighborhood because I know, you know, a lot of what the developments are local to me. And I would see they just didn't show up anywhere. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to, uh, as we come to the end here, I want to touch on something that you've mentioned to me a few times. You never mm -hmm. thought that you would be founding a tech nonprofit at 50 years old. Uh, and you said, you've said that it's been challenging to, to call yourself and identify yourself as a tech entrepreneur. T tell me more about that and, and what advice would you have to others that maybe are feeling a similar kind of, you know, like they, they don't look like the traditional tech entrepreneur and therefore shouldn't be starting something like this. Yeah, so of course I would encourage people to give it a try, which is funny for me to say because it was very hard for me to get the idea in my head that it was something I could do. Mm -hmm. um, and so back to why that was the case, I, yeah, I don't look like a tech entrepreneur. I'm a woman. I am 
you know, well into middle age. Um, I was, though, someone who cared about the issue really, really desperately and passionately. And I think that's definitely where, you know, people say for entrepreneurs, you should be in love with the problem and wanting to solve the problem. And I knew from my own experience, and I, I'm not somebody who's had lived experience with housing instability, but those things that I mentioned from, you know, my earliest career, working at a homeless shelter, working in legal services, I had this very direct experience with people who had, as I said, amazing resourcefulness, amazing talents and they were thwarted by a lack of information and so what i realized is that while i don't know and i still don't know a whole lot about technology um i brought to it my subject matter expertise because i had worked in affordable housing for 25 years i developed affordable housing i understood what all these programs were i understood that actually they're pretty simple when you boil them down they're not all that different um, and i also brought my network, which by you know that stage in my career was pretty vast. And that helped um, found the effort and launch the site. Mm. And so I do think people should, you know, kind of get in the mindset of, well, what could I bring to this? What do I care about? And even if you don't bring technology expertise and you feel reluctant to, I, the first few times I even used the term API, I wanted to laugh at myself. Like, and I felt like, well, everybody knows, Jennifer, you don't know what you're talking about. But I just said it anyway. Um, and you'll learn all those things. Or you'll bring along other people who know them. You don't have to know everything. But you'll bring your expertise, your lived experience, your problem-solving skills, your connections, all those things. And I would really encourage people to do it. And particularly encourage people who do not look like your average technology mm -hmm. engineer. Um, if you look at what is being done in the world of technology today, most of it doesn't address social justice issues. M many, much of it makes them worse. Mm -hmm. So having people who look different, who come from different perspectives, who are at different stages in their life, I think would only benefit what we can use this very powerful tool to do. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Well, I think that is a great place to end. Um, Jennifer, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. Excited to see where Housing Navigator goes next and hope to see 50 Housing Navigators pop up around the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great to me. Thanks, Hannah. Thank you. Next week, we'll learn about an innovative model bringing cooperative financing to urban housing. These two co-founders are hoping to answer a pretty thorny question. Can we introduce the benefits of density to urban America without displacing the people who live there? Tune in next week to learn more. That's all for today. Thanks for listening to House Party with Ivory Innovations.